Is it time? Yep. All right. Great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, wherever you are. It is uh, certainly afternoon, um, just about where all the speakers are, I'm sure. Uh, my name is Mark Travis. I'm the moderator for this session. This session is on the future landscape of labor arbitration. What is it going to look like? Again, um, we're looking at a, at a prospective look of, of 10 to 15 years down the road. Obviously, a, a lot of changes in a micro sense that we talked about in the last session. This is a bigger picture looking at more the uh, environment, if you will, the, the landscape, the legal and for lack of a better term, political structure of, of where we're going. Uh, in this world of labor arbitration and what does it look like in the next 10 to 15 years. Before we go, before we get into that, uh, before we get into the substance of that, uh, uh, it, it bears repeating, although we've said it in all the other sessions, and that is to uh, acknowledge that this whole series is dedicated to the work and the mentorship and the the guidance of David Lipsky uh, from Cornell, who's been past president of Lyra and uh, a, a mentor and coach and friend to uh, many people in this world of labor and employment relations. And this, this whole series is, is dedicated, both the, the three sessions before today, the three sessions today, and the three sessions thereafter. And uh, we wanna acknowledge that. Uh, and uh, so I can't go farther without doing that. and and, and want to do that. I hope David's on, but um, want to make that acknowledgement. Uh, like I said a minute ago, this is the, um, this, this, this uh, description is a little bit flipped. Our previous session was on the process and procedure, the micro, the micro perspective of labor arbitration, what's going on in this, in this virtual world. This session is the one that is focused on the legal and, and structural changes and uh, challenges uh, that are going on in labor arbitration um, uh, today and looking forward 10 to 15 years. The just a uh, little rules of the road, uh, game plan, um, uh, the rules today, uh, this, is, this is a conversation. It is a round table discussion. It is reasonably unrehearsed. Uh, there's not gonna be any death by PowerPoint today. These are talking points that we're going to cover uh, over the next hour. You'll be muted unless you uh, unmute yourself. I think the default is that you're, that you're going to be, um, that you're going to be muted, uh, to, but to use the chat to pose questions. And we will, as we have in previous sessions, reserve time at the end to answer the chat questions. And we'll circle back, to Mark Goff will be circling back and, and going through a uh, somewhat condensed version of the chat questions that are raised during the course of the discussion um, this afternoon. And we will end promptly uh, uh, at, at the 60 minute mark from when we get from when we get started. I uh, want to introduce briefly our speakers, uh, Steve Befort from uh, the University of Minnesota Law School, Marty Malin from the um, Chicago Kent College of Law, and Christine Newhall, uh, Senior Vice President at the American Arbitration Association. Again, my name is Mark Travis. I'm your moderator today. I'll chime in when appropriate and raise the questions. and. Um, uh, proceed forward. Uh, so what we want to do, first of all, is get this discussion started. Um, and we, again, this is somewhat unrehearsed, but I want to start off with the question as to whether or not uh, more state governments will try to, what is the trend doing? Is, there, is it a trend, a downward trend in public sector collective bargaining, or is it an upward trend in uh, state collective bargaining? And, and Marty, I think, was going to talk about that, and then uh, Christine and Steve can can chime in. Yeah. Go so, ahead. of course, uh, in 2001, we had quite a few states led by Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin just gutted public sector collective bargaining for everyone but police and fire. Um, and many other states cut back tremendously. Then we had Iowa follow uh, follow the Wisconsin model, but things may be turning around. So um, most recently in Virginia, 
Uh, Virginia for forever had prohibited public employee collective bargaining uh, and Virginia, the Virginia legislature enacted legislation to overturn that last year. Uh, we see New Mexico strengthen its public employee collective bargaining statute. Um, so, so, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think the worst may be over and maybe things are coming back a little bit. <laughs> Steve, you may have some perspective on that. Well, I think Marty's absolutely right. We, we've seen a number of states uh, that have restricted collective bargaining. I, I think whether it'll be expand or contract depends on, uh, on uh, future political elections. Both Wisconsin and Iowa, uh, the changes resulted after we had one party rule uh, with GOP governor and both houses of the legislature. In other upper Midwest states like Illinois and Minnesota, uh, we haven't had that one party rule and that has resisted um, changes. So we'll see what happens on the political climate in the future. Right. But it sounds like at least it's not, it's not, it's not taking a nosedive like we saw at one point. Uh, I think that may be a fair statement. Um, does, um, the next question sort of relates to that. And just from a personal um, uh, perspective, I note that um, where I am located in Tennessee, uh, there is a, a move, uh, there is legislation, I didn't check the status of it this morning, uh, but to um, uh, make the uh, right to work law uh, a constitutional amendment in Tennessee. And of course there's super majorities here, um, but, um, what do, what do any of you, I think uh, we were talking about, uh, Steve may be picking up on this. What are you, what have you seen, Steve, in terms of looking around the country and uh, state governments enacting right to work laws where they did not, did not otherwise exist? Well, clearly the long-term trend has been to expand the number of states that have adopted right to work laws. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people don't like the terminology right to work, but it is used to describe state laws that prohibit collective bargaining agreements from compelling non-union members who are covered by collective bargaining agreements from being compelled to finance the activities of a union uh, in terms of collective bargaining and uh, representation. Uh, the scorecard at present is that 27 states, and these are mostly states uh, in the South and in the Great Plains areas, have adopted right to work laws. Uh, and this number has been growing over time. In the last decade, Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin have, have uh, gone the right to work route. Uh, uh, a holdout was Missouri. In 2018, the Missouri legislature authorized a referendum, but the voters uh, declined to adopt uh, right to work. So Missouri falls on those states that uh, allow collective bargaining agreements to, uh, to require contributions to union activities. Policy-wise, the issue is uh, in those states, those that, that uh, are proponents of right to work uh, point towards freedom of association of not being compelled to contribute to uh, union causes that they oppose. On the other hand, union adherents point to the issue of free riders, that since unions have a duty to represent everybody in a bargaining unit, uh, there should be some contributions by individuals. And in terms of the practical impact, I, I think we've seen that uh, in states that are right to work, uh, union density is lower, it's harder to organize uh, uh, workers and, and to unions. Uh, there's some correlation with lower wages and more income inequality. Proponents of uh, right to work laws though suggest, uh, and I think there's conflicting evidence on this, that uh, uh, job growth may be higher in right to work states. Uh, but in terms of the future, uh, it's hard to tell. Clearly the trend has been towards expansion. 
I should say that in the public sector, right to work essentially exists throughout the country by virtue of the Janus decision by the US Supreme Court. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a push to, for a constitutional challenge to extend that into the private sector as well. Um, but uh, it's gonna be much harder to adopt right to work laws in blue states, I think, than red states. So we may be hitting a wall in that respect too. If I could pick up on that, really the question is who's left, right? That is, that yeah. is what states are left without right to work statutes that have complete Republican control of the, of the state government? Um, and, and as Steve mentioned, Missouri got, got overturned by, by public referendum. The only other state that I can think of is Alaska, uh, but, but there's a pretty high level of union density in Alaska. So I think the, the, the politics in Alaska militate against the, that state enacting going right to work. Um, what we have seen the most legislative action in the last couple of years has been legislative responses to Janus for, for public employees, uh, giving, giving, uh, you know, giving unions access to, to employees at orientation and in the, in, in the work on working time and things of that sort to, to enable unions to, to uh, counteract some of the effect of Janus. <laughs> Oops, okay. Sorry, I had a little glitch there. Um, okay, so um, I'm not doing that wrong. I've lost, I've lost something here. Sure. All right. Um, the next thing I wanted to, to bring up on the on the slide is, um, and, and Steve has is is has got some experience in here, and that is on the uh, the area of police misconduct, um, and what are we seeing there in terms of uh, what changes can we uh, see in uh, arbitration of police misconduct cases, um, reducing uh, arbitrator discretion in this area. What 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 can you share with us, Steve, about um, that issue, that topic? Well, police arbitration has long been uh, controversial, particularly in the context of uh, use of force cases. Uh, but it's been particularly controversial since uh, uh, the, the death of George Floyd. And uh, what we've seen is uh, sort of a clash between uh, particularly minority groups who have, sit, who have viewed uh, police misconduct as uh, trammeling the rights of uh, the, the African-American, the black community. Uh, well, police officers uh, point to the fact that quick action discretion is needed in, in public safety circumstances. Uh, here's a quote from the New York Times. They did an op-ed on police arbitration last summer. And they said, White police officers deserve due process and protection from arbitrary disciplinary action. It is far more important that abusive or dishonest officers be removed than that, than that they receive equal treatment. And they stress to hold police officers accountable, we need to tax the arbitrators. Well, uh, <clears throat> so there clearly is a push to limit the discretion of, of arbitrators, uh, maybe even to eliminate the arbitration of discipline, uh, discipline and discharge cases for police officers. What's been happening on the ground? Uh, the District of Columbia actually has banned both uh, the negotiation, uh, collective negotiation regarding police discipline and the use of arbitration. And that, that legislation has recently been upheld um, uh, in response to a constitutional challenge. Uh, other states, two other states, Minnesota and Washington, have, uh, have taken a different route. They haven't banned police arbitration, but they've tried to limit who is handling the cases. So in Minnesota, the legislature appointed a uh, six-member panel of arbitrators who would decide on a rotating basis police cases. Uh, uh, but the standard, the just cause standard is the same, it wasn't changed. State of Washington followed suit and adopted uh, 
a rotating panel of 16 arbitrators, again, using just cause. The difference between the two states is that Minnesota forbids anyone on that panel of six arbitrators from handling any other cases, which means that no experienced arbitrators applied. It was very difficult to find arbitrators on the list. That's not required in, uh, in Wisconsin. I, I think the theory in both states is that uh, the problem that's perceived is that parties get to select the arbitrators and arbitrators are thought to split the baby to keep, to keep our jobs. Uh, I don't think anybody who arbitrates these cases uh, will uh, acknowledge, I don't think it's accurate that we uh, intentionally give wins and losses to each side so that we can get more work. But that, that is the perception, at least in, behind these two legislative bodies. Another response <clears throat> has been judicial. Um, uh, in Illinois, we've had a recent case where uh, a court expanded the use of the public policy exception and uh, ruled that the reinstatement by an arbitrator of, a, of, a, of an individual who was accused of dishonesty in handling uh, uh, a detainee case uh, violated public policy because discharge was uh, the appropriate resolution in that case. That seems an expansion of public policy uh, beyond most cases in the past, which looked to whether reinstatement violates a clear public policy. But we may see this as a way of limiting discretion uh, as well. What, what I haven't seen much, but what I think may be a better solution is to uh, play with the standards of, uh, of just cause and basically try to narrow discretion by suggesting adopting a standard of a presumption in favor of a discharge decision unless abusive discretion or a disparate treatment or due process problem is, a, is established. But the difficulty there is crafting the, the standard. And I haven't seen many, uh, many do that. So the, the path forward isn't, isn't clear, but there is a trend towards restricting uh, discretion. And uh, in Minnesota, we're watching the George Floyd trial. And uh, depending how that comes out, we could see uh, another round of reverberation. So stay tuned. Hey, do you see that those changes in standards being more uh, statutory or per contract? I, I think it almost has to be by statute. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, I don't think the police unions are going to be very receptive to modifying standards. Although I could be wrong on that. Marty or Christine, any any thoughts about any follow up on uh, that's a pretty uh, that's a great overview of the issue. Yeah. It was very thorough. Go ahead, Marty. Go ahead. Yeah. Just just a couple of things. One of the other things we're seeing legislatively in a number of states, including Illinois, is is statutory uh, procedures making it easier and expanding the grounds to decertify police officers. So. It, basically prohibiting an individual from working as a police officer ever again, which would just totally preempt the whole disciplinary process. Um, and, and something that just popped into mind in terms of changing standards, where, where we've seen one change, in, one example of changing standards for review of, of discharges involves the uh, Veterans uh, Administration Accountability Act and, and Whistleblower Protection Act, which changed the standard for review of uh, by arbitrators or by the Merit Systems Protection Board of terminations of VA employees um, from preponderance of the evidence to substantial evidence. And the way that's been interpreted is, is it, 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 it's really come close to employment at will now for, for, for VA employees. Um, I, I would hope that that would not be uh, what anyone would be looking toward to, to in terms of reforming the review of police discipline or discipline of any public, any employee. <laughs> the, uh, great, okay, so uh, let me move it, pop the screen back up there. 
So next point, next point of discussion, and and um, uh, Marty had some had some particular thoughts about this about the if we'll see any changes in Supreme Court deference to labor arbitration awards and or the the Steelworker trilogy, and you had some interesting observations that frankly I had I had missed um, previously, but uh, you picked up on. So uh, tell us tell us some what you're thinking in terms of that particular query. Sure, I'm really concerned here, right? So, so we know traditionally uh, the, the grievance arbitration is considered a continuation of the collective bargaining process and a continuation of uh, the party's uh, workplace self-governance. And, and that of course goes all the way back to the Steelworkers Trilogy in 1960 and, and has been the Supreme Court's view of the labor arbitration process ever since until 2009. Uh, April 1st, when Clarence Thomas wrote um, 14 Penn Plaza versus, uh, versus Pyatt, which you know we all know uh, gave the green light for collective bargaining agreements to waive employees' rights to sue and require them to take their statutory claims through the grievance and arbitration procedure. But when one looks at Thomas's opinion, um, one doesn't see any even lip service to labor arbitration as the party's act of workplace self-governance, the continuation of the collective bargaining process. Instead, he writes about labor arbitration. Parties go to opt for arbitration because of its efficiency that they have advantages. Now, so he's treating it the same as employment arbitration, commercial arbitration, etc. Um, then in 2015, the court decided M&G Polymers versus Tackett, uh, which was not an arbitration, but was a, a 301 action um, concerning retiree health insurance benefits. Uh, and the court said, we interpret under, under section 301, we interpret collective bargaining agreements in accordance with ordinary principles of contract law, um, which is the first time we've seen that from the court. Um, and some lower courts have now picked up on that. Um, there, there are two cases that are particularly concerning, a 2016 decision of the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, U.S. Soccer Federation versus U.S. National Soccer Team Players Association, and a 2019 decision of the Third Circuit, Monongahela Valley Hospitals versus Steelworkers. And in both instances, the court vacated the courts vacated arbitration awards, um, and and instead, because the arbitrator's interpretation of the contract, in the court's view, was inconsistent with the plain meaning of the language of the collective bargaining agreement, and therefore flew in the face of ordinary principles of contract law. Um, so this is an area that's quite concerning and and, and still evolving. I saw in the chat someone asked for the names of the Supreme Court cases again, 14 Penn Plaza LLC versus Pyatt, a 20, 2009 decision, M&G Polymers versus Tackett, a 2015 decision. Those are both Supreme Court. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and uh, if there's any more questions about that particular topic, I put those in the chat and we'll, we'll circle back with those. Yeah, I'll uh, put those case was... names in the chat. Okay, great, great, thanks, thanks. Um, Steve, did you, uh, or Chris, any, any follow up on that, those uh, issues? We're gonna get to, we're gonna load up on uh, Christine here in the next, in the next slide. So um, um, any follow up on those good. comments? Anything? No, not really. Okay, no. great, great. Okay. Um, the the next thing, the next uh, the next um, topic I wanted to mention was federal sector. Um, what changes can be expected in, in federal sector? And and I sort of volunteered to hop hop on this uh, this topic uh, to some degree, um, and 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 discuss the whole federal sector. Uh, complexion of things. Um, I think the next few years, can't say 10 or 15, because it's a very cyclical 
cyclical area. Uh, but the next 10 to, the next few years are going to be quite unpredictable and sporadic in terms of what the future holds for federal sector labor arbitration. I'm aware of a couple of studies, one that I participated in, one that I read about, um, where the uh, where the, the the Federal Labor Relations Authority, the the reversal rate or the rate at which arbitration awards, are set aside by the federal by, by the FLRA as is quadruple not quadrupled but three but it's like seventy five percent reversal from the Trump FLRA versus the Bush or the Obama uh, looking at you know seventy five percent in the in the Trump era and twenty five percent in the in the Bush and Obama area era. Uh, in terms of reversal of arbitrators. And that provides for quite a level of inconsistency because these things get in the things, these things get in the system and it takes a while for them to filter their way out over time. And uh, another issue that's come up is the, is the appeals to the DC circuit out of the FLRA. And uh, I was looking at this for another, for another project not long ago. And just by virtue of the uh, the the those cases that came out of the the FLRA that were that were the that were made up of the Trump appointees, there had been like four uh, cases that had gone to the D.C. Circuit, and there's more come in since that since I looked at that. But there were four at that time, and three of those had been uh, remanded back to the FLRA. Where the for the FLRA had reversed the arbitrator's award, it had gone to the DC Circuit, and the DC Circuit had had reversed the authority and sent it back. So it's quite volatile in the federal sector. I'm not here to talk about. I mean, I'm not mentioning the the whole collective bargaining and the executive orders and that sort of thing that provides some more instability to the process. I think, um, but the the FLRA, the DC Circuit, and what's going on with arbitrator's awards, uh, I think it's it's fair to say that that it's quite unstable uh, and there's going to be, a, I, I believe there'll be a shift back to perhaps more the type of review that arbitrators awards received under the Bush or Obama FLRA. So, um, and, and um, Marty, uh, Steve, Chris, any any thoughts about that? Any, any feedback? And also, um, I, I know uh, Arthur Perlstein's on the it's in this call as well, and they do a lot of federal sector work. So um, we would like to hear what Arthur has to say as well, although he's not technically a panelist on this one. I would love to hear what he has to say about that. I, I see him there. He just popped up on the top of my screen there. So any of you want to chime into that? What I, I wonder just... about for a future trend is whether uh, more arbitrators will now uh, raise their hand and say, I'm willing to do federal cases again because I think some had uh, uh, sort of thrown up their hands and said uh, the procedures, the standards are so <clears throat> up in the air that uh, I just see not handle those type of cases. So I wouldn't be surprised to see more people, more arbitrators getting in the federal business. Now, all those FLRA decisions were two to one with Ernest Dubester uh, being the dissent um, the, the statute requires that no more than two members of the FLRA can be from the same political party. So Ernest Dubester was the Democrat still on the authority, who has mm -hmm. now been designated to chair the FLRA by President Biden. One of those two Republicans, James Abbott, his term expired a while ago. So he's holding over. And as soon as President Biden appoints, presumably a Democrat, uh, and uh, nominates and the Senate confirms a Democrat uh, to, to fill that position, Abbott will be gone and the, the, the dynamic will flip to one the other way. And I think all of those best of dissents will become majority opinions. I, that's the, but the, the enemy's gonna, it, it's, it'll take a while for that to filter all back out again. That's, that's, that's the, always the challenge in these, whether it be NLRB or FLRA, there's that, there's that cycle of run through that's, to, that's got to cleanse the system for lack of a better term from the previous, whatever your perspective is, um, decisions. Um, One thing that will happen quickly though, uh, once, once that flip 
takes place is arbitrators that have had to become very, very cautious or circumspect in, in at least drafting their awards um, or, or willingness to take cases, um, as Steve mentioned, I, I think that will, uh, that will change um, very quickly. Um, and I, I just think um, there, you know, a lot of, it, it's gonna be quite dramatic at, because the, the changes in the last four years are uh, obviously very, very uh, dramatic. Um, one of the things that I did wanna mention uh, when, when Steve talked about more arbitrators getting back into federal sector, um, w one of the things that we did crack down on at FMCS is uh, the insistence that if you hold yourself out as uh, experienced uh, in federal sector, that, that you'd better know what you're doing. Because uh, we got a lot of, we, we started to get complaints uh, from both sides, but also from the authority uh, of getting arbitration awards that people were not aware that the federal sector is, is different. Um, you know, we had cases where, um, where the arbitrator awarded uh, back pay, and then there was a request for um, interest in attorney's fees, and the arbitrators were saying, oh, well, in arbitration, um, you know, the custom is not to award interest or attorney's fees, so I reject that out, out of hand, not apparently being aware of the Bank Pay Act, uh, just uh, as, as one example. I think it's fair to say that, um, and what I, I mean, I'm one of those that takes them because I like, I mean, I just, I, 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 there are challenges. There are, it is a different uh, rules of the road and rules of the game, um, but it's, it is a, it, it is a challenge. One thing that I've, I've seen in, in the work that I've done in looking at it is that just like Arthur says, it's a question of uh, remedy that the arbitrator is using a different standard in terms of back pay it's in terms of exceeding because the federal sector has such a, a strong management rights clause and the, an arbitrator not accustomed to federal practice um, exceeds his or her authority under that, under the management rights clause. So it's a whole different, it is a whole different world. Arthur, do you, do you anecdotally, do you see uh, like Steve said, arbitrators getting back in. Are, are there are there a fair number that that don't do it, and do you see them perhaps getting back in? Well, I I I, I don't have any figures on it, but I do. I, I've had so many conversations with arbitrators who say, "Okay, I give up. This is ridiculous." I mean, arbitrators are very experienced in federal sector. Mm -hmm. saying, you know, that this is ridiculous um, and, and it's just not worth doing this anymore. Right. But I don't know how many of them have unchecked the box for that. Right, right, uh, right. Well, I, I was just looking this morning, 50% of my cases are federal sector. So I'm going to keep the check. I'm going to keep the box checked. Okay. <laughs> um, for me personally. They, they, still, they still do pay eventually. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Great. So um, moving on, I want to, we've, we've, uh, we're not uh, disregarding Christine and she's going to, she's going to help us out here on some of these um, next slides that we want to get to. Um, and my, my, my screen share just froze up. Okay. Well, let me just uh, look to my old fashioned paper copy then and, and let Christine um, uh, take a stab at some of these questions about uh, the broader profession in terms of diversity. We covered that a little bit in the last session about diversity um, from a from perhaps a case by case micro view, but in terms of looking at it from a broader perspective, talk to us a little bit, um, Christine, about uh, what you've seen and what the association has done. Uh, with diversity initiatives and and what kind of impact that's having or is going to have or is intended to have on the on the profession. Right. And I do apologize. I was not on the last session because of another. Um, so if I repeat something, you, you can stop me. Um, well, you shouldn't have said. I mean, because there might be people that aren't that weren't that okay. were also not there. So go ahead. So the um, 
the labor panel um, of the American Arbitration Association has the 34% of the panel we would have as diverse. And I should kind of put a footnote there that we rely on arbitrators to tell us they, they self-select whether or not they're going to provide us the information in terms of their diversity. Um, so 34% of the labor panel is not as high as our employment diversity, which is at 42%. So we're looking at how can we uh, increase the diversity of, of the panel. Um, and it has been difficult. And one of the difficulties, I think, is the um, qualifications or criteria to be admitted to the labor arbitrator panel is that uh, individual cannot be acti an active advocate for labor or management. And uh, we have, and I have shared uh, a program, that AAA Higginbotham Fellow Program, which started in 2009. And we have had um, over 130 um, diverse participants in the Higginbotham Fellows, and many have shown interest in becoming uh, labor arbitrators. Uh, but they have full-time jobs. Uh, their full-time jobs are as an advocate. Uh, and when applying to the panel, how do I apply? I don't know whether I will be successful or not um, and give up my job. Uh, that's a big stepping stone in, in terms of recruitment to the labor panel, because as we all know, it is difficult to start a full-time um, profession to be a labor arbitrator or any arbitrator. Um, I will say for the labor panel, it is our only panel, our uh, only segment of our roster of arbitrators that does require that neutrality, that complete neutrality that um, one is not an advocate for a union or management. So looking at kind of the that's where we are today. Um, and if anyone on this um, presentation wants more information on the Higginbotham Fellows Program, um, it is on our website, uh, but you can also uh, get in touch with me if you want more information. It's a, it's a great program um, that people are mentored uh, and actually get a, a door open to the field of arbitration. Um, so here we are today, 10, 15 now, years from now, the initiatives of, you know, is that the qualification that should exist? Uh, should labor arbitrators or should agencies consider that um, arbitrators for a period of time could apply, diverse arbitrators apply to the panel and uh, be on the panel for X number of years, uh, five years, and then have to make a choice to become a full-time labor arbitrator or return to advocacy or whatever their other uh, profession was. This has been raised uh, and there have been many other um, kind of how can we recruit um, and have active diverse arbitrators serving on our panel. Um, and it's not only through the Higginbotham Fellowship, but uh, are, are there other ways to um, work with the National Academy of Arbitrators, the FMCS, other organizations to um, promote new arbitrators uh, that are diverse to be acceptable by the parties. Um, I think in this profession, in the labor profession, it's hard to break in. There's, there's a long legacy here uh, and parties pick who they know, which is a positive, but we also need to um, have a more diverse panel available. Um, and I think the parties, uh, there are many requests that we get now and we assume they will increase in the future um, you know, I want a list of arbitrators with X background or familiar with X languages, uh, Spanish being one of them. Um, and we're seeing an increase of those requests when cases are filed, parties requesting certain um, criteria when we put the list together or make uh, appointments to two cases. I don't know if collective bargaining agreements will in the future contain specific language of what an arbitrator or what a list should be composed of. Um, we do, uh, as part of our program, our list of arbitrators, we do um, 
ensure that our lists have at least 20% diverse panelists where parties qualifications are met. And we do that when we're putting lists together for the labor. And in the future, might that increase, um, you know, the percentage? Um, I don't know, it's something to consider. Um, but we, it may be that the language in collective bargaining agreements that impact the filing of cases may have more specific information on what criteria the arbitrator should have. Um, and, and all of this comes, comes you know, back to we have to service uh, the parties requesting our services and we have to meet their needs. So we may need to change um, some of the criteria, the qualifications to be on a panel, which does would then mean change in rules, um, maybe looking at the code of ethics. So there's a lot of things combined in that. Um, and I think in the future, in order to have um, more diverse panelists or a larger number uh, available to the parties, we have to increase uh, having our uh, diverse arbiters speak on programs, do more meet and greets. You know, the future holds, you know, it has to be a partnership uh, by the current arbitrators working with the new arbitrators coming on. Um, so I look to my fellow panelists if they want to add anything to that comment. I am trying to be uh, cognizant of time as well. Right. Marty or Steve? Well, uh, I'll, I'll just raise two things. One is I know uh, some, some states and areas have really worked hard to uh, recruit and train diverse arbitrators. Uh, I know New York and Dick Edelman and his fellows have, have done a really good job of recruitment. We've had a harder time in places like Minnesota where we've got uh, uh, the minority population is much smaller. But the, the second, the question I'd like to ask Christine, I guess, is, is the selection rate also for diverse arbitrators also increasing as the percentage of diverse panelists grow? Is the selection rate also growing or are the parties sort of sticking with the, the old white guys that they already know? Um, well, I think it's a combination of those two. It depends on where that panel where the selection is being made. I, I think we, I could say that in our New York area where we do have many diverse arbitrators, there's probably a higher selection, but it's because of the mentorship that many of the established arbitrators did with new panelists coming on and introducing them and taking them to hearings and being part of the community and making sure those introductions were done. I don't think it's ticked up enough. I think there are areas of the country where we have seen a little bit of growth of, of selection, um, but the parties are uh, hard to change uh, until they know and are comfortable with who is this person. And, and I think that does not just involve diversity. Any new panelist has a tough time if they have not been mentored and um, kind of known by the community that's making um, the selection. And, and we understand that need, but we hope by kind of developing more opportunities, um, there may be more um, openness to select new arbitrators. Christine, can you speak to this point here about other than, I mean, the Higginbotham Fellows Program is, is aimed at developing that and that sort of thing. But in terms of the specific eligibility requirements, are those affected in any material way by diversity initiatives? We know the practical side of the, you know, who gets selected and who doesn't, but in terms of pure eligibility. Well, it, the, um, the criteria or the qualification criteria for admittance to the panel does have that um, specific line that one cannot be an advocate or actively representing uh, either union or management. Uh, and that um, standard has kept quite a few very highly qualified individuals from even applying to the panel. Mm -hmm. I think the other criteria we do require that there be nine recommendations, um, three from union, three from management, and three from neutrals. And sometimes, you know, for new 
new panel panelists or new applicants that that's tough um, to get nine references from an area that you're trying to break into and whether or not there'll be changes in that in the future uh, we get valuable information from the references that we do receive but that could be something that would be changed in the future okay um okay um let's see next next slide advancing no i'm still not i'm still not advancing my slides okay um so um moving on to the next slide i don't know if, yeah mark's got that so yeah um thank you my mind was frozen up there for it's still frozen we talked about this a little bit in the last session um i've got some thoughts on that um but we know that there's a common criticism of employment arbitration um in, in of employment arbitration in the, in the sense of, I'm not saying it's valid or not, but there are criticisms out there of it being, uh, they're having being in increased legalization and inefficiencies in employment arbitration. Uh, does anybody, uh, I frankly see some degree of that, some degree of increasing legalization, but I think there's also some efficiencies that are obtained these days in, in labor arbitration that we didn't see in times past. Uh, do, do any of our panelists see any down, any increasing legalization in the labor arbitration process? And if so, is it good or bad? So in my experience, the parties control the process. And so I have some parties, you know, that, that for example, insist uh, that I apply the rules of evidence. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, they're, they're both objecting and expecting, you know, ev evidentiary rulings. But for the most part, I think it's it's still pretty pretty loose, pretty informal, um, it, and it, it really is the party's control. At least, in, if you by increasing legalization, you mean, you know, it's looking more and more like a court hearing. Right, right, right. Do you do you um, give them? Um, do you still retain that discretion to say, I don't care what, if, if both of you agree to the formal rules of evidence, I'm still going to, I want to hear this. I tell them I'm a, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a guest at your table. If, if okay. you agree on a process, that's what I'm going to follow. If you All can't right. agree, I'm going to rule. <laughs> right. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Steve, Chris. Well, in terms of the, the hearing, yeah, I, I would agree with Marty that, that the hearings in the labor field continue to be relatively informal. I, I don't tend to use the rules of evidence uh, strictly. I like to let the parties uh, tell their story until it gets too late in the day and I'm tired. But uh, uh, where I see more legalization clearly is on, on post hearing briefs. When I first started, I would say only half the cases or so had briefs now, I'd say in my part of the world, 90% of the cases have briefs. As an arbitrator, that's fine. I, it helps me make decisions to get, to get briefs. Uh, but that is an increasing legalization, I think. And you do see cases where the party that has a lawyer has a much better brief than the party that doesn't. Uh, so that's a little bit of an imbalance and, and yeah. resources makes an impact there. I, I'm starting to see a little more pre-hearing motion practice, which never really used to exist in the labor field, uh, exists a lot in the employment field, and I'm starting to see it, uh, certain discovery motions that I never saw before, but it's still relatively rare. I also think that um, in, in terms of the post-hearing briefs, um, I, I get very frustrated when I, then I see the reply brief to the brief and this kind of um, building a case where is it necessary? And I often hear some fr frustration from arbitrators and I look them in the eye and say, okay, if you don't need it, why, why are you accepting it? You know, set the stage to a point or just ask the question, mm -hmm. what are you going to tell me? What, what is it that you're going to tell me in a reply brief? Um, but I think, Steve, you're right. I, I do see an increase of uh, post-hearing briefs, and I often wonder about the necessity. Uh, you know, 30, 25, 30 years ago, um, you didn't see it as, as frequently. 
Um, I also think using the word uh, legalization, you know, I, with all of the changes and kind of threats to employment arbitration, um, sometimes people leave out what type of arbitration they're threatening and will use arbitration in a generic term. Uh, and I, I think that's a slippery slope. Um, and I would hate to, to see labor arbitration um, have legalization in, in terms of changes. Um, the good news is uh, all of the state and federal, you know, leave out and specifically say not related to collective bargaining or labor arbitration. But I worry at times with the generic term arbitration used. Yeah. And I think the, uh, along with briefs, now I haven't seen a reply brief. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, uh, uh, wow. Um, Be thankful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, huh? Reply briefs seem to be routine in Wisconsin labor arbitrations. <laughs> I also, also, also court reporters. Time. Court reporters also. Yeah, I mean, and what I, back to the rules of evidence, it's just like, um, I think there's a there's a world of of young perhaps lawyers that might be fresh out of law school that um, want to take all that you know um, that that evidence that they had and use it in an arbitration when a non lawyer on the other side who's done this for years is so much more effective. We've all can we all can attest to that um, and make a much more smooth hearing. Um, but, um, I think that's a nature of, you know, we don't have enough litigation for young lawyers anymore. So this is where they want to, uh, stake their claim. Um, so, uh, we're getting close on time. Yeah, we're getting very close on time. Um, so, um, just, if we could just speak briefly to, uh, panel selection versus, uh, rotating panels versus, um, ad hoc appointment, what we're seeing, what you all are seeing in that world. Many more contractual panels. I don't call them permanent panels because there's nothing permanent about them. Eventually you wear out your welcome and get kicked off. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, I, at least in terms of my docket, it is dominated by those contractual panels rather than AAA or FMCS or, or just individual ad hoc appointments. <laughs> we do see, maybe. Go ahead. Right. We Go do ahead, see an uh, increase of the rotating panels for a certain number of years that a rotating panel will be, you know, five, you know, five panelists for two years and then they'll have alternatives. Um, and, and, you know, the association still you know, provides administration, but it isn't a list on every case. It's that rotation of arbitrators for a period of time. It's actually very efficient in, in terms of the selection and knowing who's next um, on the list, or it's done by um, who's got the date available that the parties have agreed to for the next hearing. Um, so that has increased. I'm hoping ad hoc selection doesn't become the norm. Um, so I, I won't speak on that any further. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Steve, anything, your perspective? That yeah, I, I see that too, that uh, uh, temporary panels, if you will, is, uh, <laughs> is growing, growing in use. But as much as Christine doesn't like it, I'm seeing more ad hoc selections too. Parties will, who I've had past cases with will call up and say, we wanna, we want to use you because we want to get this done fast. We've done it in the past, so uh, we're not going to go through the agency. So I yep, that's the reality. Yeah, I think it may be a function of the the shrinking density to some degree too. So, um, okay, so uh, we've just got a few minutes left, and I'm going to let. Uh, Mark Goff uh, take over in terms of, I haven't been keeping up with the chat comments uh, specifically, that's been his role. So Mark, you wanna run with some uh, chat questions? Yeah, I'll get right, yeah, I'll get right to it. So there are two questions involving police arbitration. One is uh, asking the, the, the panelists whether they support a public database of police arbitration decisions. And the second question in, um, concerns whether the diversity and the composition of uh, 
potential arbitrators is going to affect uh, if you're going to see differences in decision making out, you know, in the outcomes, particularly in police arbitration. I'll okay. happy to start it out and I'll say yes to both. Uh, the, the first one, public databases. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Parties know what their uh, experience base is by seeing published decision or, or available on databases decisions in the past. I'm a little bit spoiled, or uh, maybe spoiled is the word, but in Minnesota, every, every decision has to be submitted to the state agency. So we're already doing that. Um, but uh, I, I think sunshine is a, is a fine idea. In terms of will more diverse panels result in uh, maybe uh, decisions that are a little different than we've seen in the past. And I think it's likely to have some impact. Uh, people view cases through their own lens of experience as well as the evidence presented by the party. So I don't think it's going to be an enormous shift, but I think it will have some impact. There, um, both in the employment and consumer area, we do have a public docket for decisions and, and process that uh, is available. Um, so for, you know, police cases or labor cases in general, I, I wouldn't, you know, I would support it. It's always in how and what's the mechanism and where will it be available. Um, and But those are um, kind of administrative issues. Um, whether the decisions will be different, um, I don't know, I, I assume so. Uh, but Marty, you might wanna weigh in on that one, I'm not sure. Well, it, it's a question of, you know, it's party selection, right? So. I mean, if I'm a union rep and I'm representing a police officer who's been disciplined or terminated for excessive force, I'm probably going to strike people of color on the panel. <laughs> Sorry to, to stereotype there, but oh, that everybody stereotypes when they when they do their strikes. And... Any quick follow up, Mark? I'm sorry, we're running short. Um, no, I think the only, uh, I think it's the end of the day, <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> um, or you guys uh, are just so comprehensive in your answers that you leave no okay. questions on Good. the table. Um, and, uh, there's another, uh, diversity related question, which, uh, that do you find that the panels who are pre-selected, uh, uh, include, uh, more women and people of color. So I've had a couple of instances where parties that I've worked with, you know, for decades actually approached me and said, we're going over our panel and, you know, we, we need a panel of arbitrators that looks more like the people who, uh, who work for us um, and have asked me for recommendations, uh, specifically of arbitrators of color. And I've been able to, to recommend some people who they then added to their panels. So you know, parties can really do a lot here. And in, in one case, it was someone who was brand new, who was apprenticing with me, you know, um, and, and, and that's how she got her first arbitration cases was, was through that panel. And you do hear that quite frequently. We need arbitrators that are reflective of our workforce. Yeah, that's good news to hear um, for sure. Okay, we're we're about uh, we are we got to end right at right at the, the hour mark. So um, uh, you can follow up um, separately if you'd like to with any of the presenters. Um, but let me kind of close this off by hitting a few uh, a few thank yous and and uh, closing remarks. First of all, thank you to all the panelists for participating. Um, and to Mark for uh, keeping up with the chat and watching that. Um, and thank you to Bernadette and Emily from the Lyra staff for uh, backing all this up and doing as, uh, a lot of the background as well as uh, Dick Fincher for his organizational efforts and putting, putting this together. The whole dispute resolution interest section that, that, that helped uh, put all this together. And that leads me to the next point, and that is to certainly um, uh, take the opportunity if you don't belong to Lyra to, to sign up and, and uh, join Lyra, join your local chapter, 
sign up for the conference, the annual conference that is this June. And uh, with that, with that registration or with that joining of Leary, you also get the free membership to the dispute resolution interest section. Uh, interest section. And then uh, finally, I want to thank um, everybody for, um, uh, or the, the um, sponsors, the Academy, the National Academies Research and Education Foundation, the AAA, and the Association for Conflict Resolution. Um, there's a link there in the chat to uh, where you can join Lyra. Uh, there's also, a, when you go to that Lyra web.org page, you'll see the drop down just like you had for this session for the next set of sessions uh, in April that uh, certainly uh, is going to be uh, another good set of uh, series of, of uh, discussions as well. With that, I believe we are concluded. Uh, all those messages are in the chat there with those links, and I thank everybody for their participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.